Welcome to the Ridgecrest Podcast. This is where we take time each week for a deeper look into the previous Sunday sermon. My name is Matt. I'm the executive and discipleship pastor here at Ridgecrest. And once again, I'm joined with Michael Estes, our senior pastor. Uh, missed you last week. But yeah, I missed you guys. Some nice time away and yeah. be able to get away with the family and relax a little bit. And I'm sure podcasting with Logan was always fun. It was. We were concerned if, if we would have another episode, um, just because you never know what Logan will say. Uh, so, but but all went well. Um, our editing department did a great job, you know, cutting out the things that didn't need to be in there. So we're good. Steven's making his money over there. <laughs> no, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. Lo, lo, Logan did a great job. And, um, you know, another great opportunity, you know, those of you who maybe didn't hear last week, great. You know, if you know someone who's in college or going mm-hmm. into college, great resource uh, to point people to and so if, if you're listening this week and you know go back and check that one out and um, again just forward it to those college students or you know high school you know graduates or whoever it might be because they could really benefit from a lot of you know what, what Logan had to say last week um, so so this week you got back into your series of, of shelter in the Psalms and looking at Psalms of Thanksgiving mm-hmm. and so um, we, we've kind of progressed through and uh, if I understand correctly this will be your last kind of part of this series. Yeah. Um, we still got a few weeks to go, so mm-hmm. it's not like this was the last week, but this introduces the last theme of Psalms that, that you'll be looking at. Yeah. Um, I thought it was a you know great you know start to this series, really looking at this this idea of, of gratitude and developing this heart of gratitude and um, those types of things. And one, one of the things you specifically talked about was the, the idea of you know, shouting exuberantly. Yeah. You know, and, and I love that. And you know, of course you use the illustration that um, you know I think many of us have heard, you know, many times and, you know, in trying to encourage others to look at worship as more of a, uh, more of an expression yeah. of, of, of our gratitude and our, our praise, but this idea of, of shouting, just being truly mm-hmm. excited and you go to a sports game and you do that without hesitation, you know, and but then you come to church and you, you know, it almost feels like it's taboo and you can't do right. it. Um, and one thing that I've heard, you know, a lot of reasons, you know, one of the reasons why people kind of had that mindset is they're kind of too focused on, well, Church is supposed to be more reverent, more solemn, mm-hmm. you know, because we just we should be reverent towards God rather than shouting and yelling and, and those types of things. Right. And so, um, so I guess the question would be is, you know, how would you differentiate between this idea of being reverent and you know openly expressing gratitude, like like you like you said? Yeah, I think um, it, it's an interesting discussion because like one of the things that we don't want to encourage when we think about the idea of being excited about being a church and openly expressing that excitement is you don't want to distract there's a difference between like doing that and then just just being loud for the sake of distraction i um I joke with my kids every now and then that sometimes they just make noise for the sake of making noise. Like they just don't want silence to be in the room. So they're just like, <laughs> they're going to beat on something or just going to make, yeah. make noises. And you're like, what is, like, what is going on? Yeah. Like why Picked are, on the other one? So that one that makes, makes noise. noise. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Right. So I think what we have to do is we have to realize that like being reverent and being openly expressive uh, in, in worship are not, two contrary ideas. Yeah. Um, I think they're two sides of the same coin. Um, one of the things that we should never believe is that God is boring. Um, and if if our worship service gives off the impression that God is boring, then we've done we've done poorly. Yeah, that's a great um, point. And so uh, one thing I love the way C.S. Lewis kind of throws this idea out is that God is jovial. Um, he is, out of all the beings in the universe, he is literally the most jovial, happy being. Like I, I remember one time we, we had a chapel service at one of the private schools that, it, that we uh, taught at, and um, he was talking about Jesus. And I think he had good intentions, but I think he just, the way he came across, it came across so poorly that I actually spent the rest of the day with my students kind of like, all right, we need to stop and think through what he said. Because basically he tried to make the point that Jesus was never happy. He never laughed. He was always serious, always solemn. And just look at all the pictures we have of him. Right. Yeah. I mean, obviously those are <laughs> somebody was there to take that picture, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but I mean, like, ultimately, Jesus was sad all the time. And I just have a hard time believing the fact that like we have scriptures that talk about how spiritually, mentally, physically healthy things like laughter are in life. It's not good to laugh all the time. Obviously, that's the case. But, but ultimately, it is, 
it is we should have a well-rounded understanding of things like openly expressing our faith um, in front of others. Um, and at the same time, being able to pull back and understand this is a moment where this is very weighty, this is very solemn. I should be able to see when those things happen. And so, you know, when Jesus commands us or, or Paul command us to, to mourn with those who mourn and rejoice with those who rejoice, yeah. we should do both. Right. And we should be able to do both. And so I don't think... I don't think that we should see this idea of being reverent and this idea of openly expressing gratitude as two contrary ideas but two different sides of the same coin. They're both a part of worship, um, and they're both appropriate times to do it. And the key is to not create disorder and distraction. Uh, Paul kind of gets into this a little bit in uh, 1 Corinthians, I think 12 through 14, basically he's talking about order in church and the fact that we don't need everybody expressing their, their spiritual gift at the same time. If we do that, basically we're just showing off. Yeah. That's all we're there to do. Yeah. And um, the, the gifts are there to edify, to, to help grow, to encourage, those sorts of things. And so in the same way, when we think about expressing gratitude openly in church, we should do it at the appropriate times and in the appropriate ways. But that doesn't mean I'm going to sit in my pew and be real, really quiet until I feel like it's the pastor wants me to clap or say amen or something like that. If you feel um, that I, we had we had one guy in our chapel services and in, in seminary who was very openly expressive in his support of points that he thought that the pastor was making or the or the speaker was making that uh, coincided with biblical truth. Now it was interesting because we could always listen to him and have a pretty good idea of whether or not the guy he w- was on on track as far as what was going on biblically, because when he wasn't, he was very quiet. Mm. And so there was, it, it was about affirming biblical truth. Yeah. Um, and so I think, you know, maybe putting in, in place some personal standards for this is a time where I think it's good to be openly expressive. Um, and it may be as simple as, well, this is a time where I think the the pastor or the worship leader or the song that we're singing is very much affirming biblical truth, and I want to agree with it. So uh, those, those, to me, that's uh, I don't know that there's a difference. It's more like a yeah. an appropriate time and place. Yeah, <clears throat> I think that's, that's a great example. And, um, you know, h- how to just kind of build on that question a bit, you know, you, you mentioned the idea of there being order to it. Mm-hmm. You know, h- how would you encourage someone in, in that area to help them understand, you know, is what, you know, is this me just trying to boast about something or yeah. or is this an appropriate time to shout or sing or, or dance? You know, yeah. we see that in scripture and I mean, of yeah. we as Baptists, you know, that that's a <laughs> you know, that's you know, one of those things that we don't do and um, you you, all, you often hear, yeah. you know, that the Baptists are gonna gonna learn a lot from our other some of our other denominational friends when we get to heaven. We are. Um, you know, but 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 with all that being said, you know, how, how do you, you know, maybe discern what is appropriate and maybe what's not. I think anything that is godwardly focused is going to be okay. Um, if if the focus of, say, for example, I know one of the ones that like we all struggle with is when should we lift our hands in worship, right? Yeah. Uh, should my hands old, be I don't my, know what to do with my hands, <laughs> kind of. Yeah. Pockets. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, if, if you're – so focused on yourself while you do that. So like, am I raising my hand the right way or is this what, does this look appropriate? Then you should. Uh, I think that's probably the the key, like the line of uh, discrimination. Should If I'm focusing on myself, then more than likely I probably don't need to be worried about doing this. Yeah. But if it's because I'm truly responding to God and who he is and what I'm hearing from his word or what I'm hearing from the song or what what the speaker is affirming, then then I should be okay with responding in that way. You know, I should be I should be, be okay with raising my hand or um, dancing or uh, saying amen. Yeah. Um, and so <clears throat> I think that's probably the the line yeah. that we the standard we should set is if if I'm focusing on man, I hope everybody hears my amen right now, then I shouldn't say it. Yeah. But if I am, that is, I'm thinking to myself, that's so right. God is honored by what He's being said. Then I should, I should affirm that out loud. Yeah. And that helps other people know, you know, we should all affirm this truth. Sure. 
So yeah, that, that's that's really good and helpful. And um, you know, that, that's something that you know I've always struggled with myself yeah. because I'm not a very expressive person in that context. And you know, a lot of times it, for me, it's hard for me to kind of you know I have those thoughts going through my mind is like, mm-hmm. okay, should I lift my hand here? The song says I lift my hands and I'm singing, <laughs> but I'm not lifting my hands and I'm kind of, you know, going through all that, you know, but, but again, you'll hardly ever see me do that just because mm-hmm. that's internal thinking that's going on in my brain. Yep. And I know that I'm putting too much focus on that and it's distracting me from yes. worship itself. And at times I have raised my hands, my arms get tired and then I start focusing on that rather than focusing on what I'm doing, you know, yeah. and, and so so I think that's a, that's a great example. Yeah, and we'll see. I mean, uh, like you already mentioned, we're going to see all kinds of um, different forms of worship that are all appropriate in heaven. Um, yeah. And, you know, I grew up in one tradition that was very non-expressive. Yeah. Um, and then I have gone to other churches that have been very openly expressive, mm-hmm in their worship, and I've enjoyed both. It's just a matter of, one, understanding what you're stepping into, and then two, well, again, that focus. Whatever that focus is, if you're focusing on yourself while you're expressing yourself, then you're doing it wrong. Yeah. Um, uh, ultimately, everything about worship should be about God, our Godward focus. Yeah, so. and, and if that's the case, and if it is God-centered and God-focused, mm-hmm. then it's not wrong. It's yeah. just different. Yeah. You know, everyone's different. That's good. Um, one of your key points was talking about gratitude kind of as an act of service. Um, how can someone better demonstrate gratitude through service? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think uh, I think I, put, I wrote down three ideas because I think it's kind of like a three-tiered process. The first is that I think we have to expand the concept of service. Mm. I think we have a tendency to focus on service as, well, I'm doing this for the church, so this is a service. When in reality, the concept of service is much broader in Scripture. Um, a lot of it is like temple-related temple, temple related or uh, in the New Testament church-related. But beyond that, um, you know, if I have the gift of serving, that doesn't just stay within the four walls of the church. It doesn't happen just on Sunday right. morning. Um, it happens throughout my life because I have that spiritual gifting. And by the way, just because you don't have a spiritual gift necessarily doesn't mean you shouldn't practice it. So, sure. so I may not have the spiritual gift of evangelism, but I still am called by the Scriptures to evangelize. Yeah. Uh, that just means somebody's better at it than I am. So going back to this idea of service, that's where I think the second part of this is that we start to develop a theology of work. Um, it's something we don't talk about much in Christian circles right now is this idea that um, – we should have an understanding of how God wants us to work. Hmm. Um, and this this goes to the last point. I'm going to come back to this theology of work in just a second, maybe some scriptures that you can look at to, to kind of develop this idea more in your own personal life. But um, the third part is the part where we see the divide come in. Is, is I mentioned this in the sermon. I think we still function under the cultural divide between sacred and secular. So, yeah. like, we have these days that are sec, uh, secular days. These are these are my work days. And so what I believe in my, my sacred life, that uh, the way uh, Francis Schaeffer put it, is that we have this upstairs room that is devoted to the sacred. And we go up there when it's time to go up there, but we come back downstairs to our secular life and we live in that downstairs area most of the time, what I'm encouraging us to do as believers and what I think the Scriptures encourage us to do is that we need to live with the overflow of the sacred into the secular parts of the world and secular parts of life so that the divide's not really there for the believer. Um, And so that goes back to this idea of a theology of work, and I thought about this a good bit while I was in, in seminary, but like a couple of passages that I think a lot of people point to when it comes to this de- developing a theology of work is for, the first one is First Corinthians ten thirty one. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. And so ultimately, everything in life can be turned to God's glory. Yeah. Um, and the same is echoed a little bit later by Paul in Colossians chapter three, uh, starting in verse uh, sixteen. Let the word of Christ. Uh, dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanks, uh, thankfulness in your hearts to God. Well, we think to ourselves, well, that's the secular part. Of, I mean, sacred part of life, right? I do that on Sunday. Yeah. You know, we let the word of Christ dwell in us richly on Sunday. We we either teach or are taught 
on Sunday. We admonish one another in wisdom, sing, we sing together psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and we probably express gratitude on Sunday. However, he doesn't stop there, and what's important for us to understand is that the the when we look at our English translation and these verses that exist here, these verse numbers, they don't exist for Paul. They never did. So when he wrote this, the thought was a continuous stream of thought, right? So let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, and he goes on about all these things that we look at, and we're like, that's Sunday. And then he goes on and says in verse 17, And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through him. And so he's like, you know what? This applies to every part of life. Right. And ultimately, I think that's probably one of the best ways that we can start to demonstrate gratitude is a realization that God is involved in every part of our life. And when we start to see that, I think it's easier for us to turn that that attention to this idea of we can be thankful about our work. I, I worry about a good number of believers that – do see this sacred secular divide as a part of their life and they're like i really hate my job i really hate you know they may not hate the people they work with but they don't really care very much about spending time with them that sort of thing and like that's an understandable to a certain part because if you're not passionate about what you do then that makes it harder to do it but i think the call in scripture is to do everything to god's glory to honor him with everything that we do. And so that means that we need to rethink our our understanding of work as an act of service that we can offer up to God. Uh, and so I think that's probably the best way to start demonstrating gratitude is to understand what our work is or what our service is. And then once we understand what it is, it's, it's easier for us to, to be thankful for it. Yeah. And it's easier for us to view work as a chore, you mm-hmm. know, and I think that motivation comes into why are we working? Well, it's you know to get money so that we can pay bills, right. so we can do this, or so we can experience that, or whatever it might be. However, you talked about the overflow, and really, if, if we can shift our thought from work as just this consequence of sin, mm-hmm. essentially to this overflow of, of our gratitude, and be able to say, "Hey, let me serve those around me, whether it be in the workplace or in the community." Um, it really has it, that additional impact to really make a difference. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I love the example you use of, of Adam and Eve. You know, we talk about kind of work was consequence of sin, you know, because you see after the fall, you know, God says, you know, speaks to the man. Now you will have to, you know, cultivate the land and things like that. However, even before that, when, when everything was still good before the fall of sin, as you mentioned, God gave them the command to work and keep the garden. Yep. You know, to, to, it looked different after the fall, but they still had this idea of work. And, and I think they were able to do that joyfully. Mm-hmm. because of the overflow of the experience they were having with God. And they didn't look at that work tending to the garden as far as just a chore, but it was a, I'm going to serve this yeah. garden that God has provided me mm-hmm. um, because of what he's done for me. And then after the fall, you see the motivation change. And now, okay, right. now I'm having to work because it's a chore versus the joy that I had in before mm-hmm. whenever I was able to serve through that gratitude. Yeah, and, and we think about the restoration that we get from Jesus. We talk about the idea that it restores us to the Father and redeem, or we're redeemed in that way, but we also need to think about the idea that it, that that redemption has implications for every part of our daily life. It's not just our spiritual life. Now we wait till we get to heaven and to experience that redemption. It's full. We can start to experience that now and enjoy that now in every part of our life through our relationships we can be reconciled to one another in our work we can again we can re reorder our thinking when it comes to that and now instead of work be the, being this thing that is done by the sweat of my brow is, is is described in genesis 3 and that it's difficult now it is something that i can turn around and it's now this joyful thing that i get to participate in so. yeah um <clears throat> In the sermon, you, you brought specific attention to the idea of creation and, mm-hmm. and God creating the world. And, you know, I think we kind of live in, in a culture, uh, and I think this isn't just our culture. I think you can look through all history and see this in, in all cultures. Um, I think this is one of the things that, that you do see in all cultures is this kind of struggle between the idea of recognizing God as creator and, con- you know, one who's in control of the universe mm-hmm. and us viewing ourselves in that role as far as us being creator of our own destiny and creator of our own um agenda and you know 
things of that sort. And so what would you say is required for an individual to kind of move from that train of thought of I'm kind of the master of my universe, I'm the master of my life, and I've got to figure out, you know, I get what I earn, you know, the, mm-hmm. you know, how do you change? You know, what, what is required to move from there to the point of recognizing God as the creator and center of the universe? Yeah, I, I want to tease out the idea that this is this is something that we see very clearly in our culture. For those who maybe are thinking about this, they're like, well, I mean, I kind of see what you're saying. One of the we see this in a lot of different places right now, but like one of the things that we we're seeing this play out, this idea of I can create myself, I can create my 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 destiny, I can create my identity is the struggle over things like gender right now. Yeah. Um, or this is my body. I, I can do with it whatever I want to do. So if I identify if I identify myself as, you know, if I'm a man but I identify myself as a woman, then that's what I am. Yeah. And so I get to decide. It's not biology. It's not, uh, you know, any of those sort of things. It is what I decide is the truth. Right. Is the truth. And so we see this very clearly, like you said, and it's not new to our culture. Ecclesiastes is really clear. There's nothing new under the sun. It's just played out in different ways. That's right. Right. And so I think the only way we get to the point to where we recognize God as creator is to be honest with ourselves. Mm. Because what we'll see is, and I mentioned this a little bit, and it was from an interview that Tim Keller did that I thought was just really interesting. Um, But he talked about the idea that like, even when we create these new identities for ourselves, we bring these expectations into the identity and we set these standards for ourselves. And then we realize we can't meet those standards. So we fail. Yeah. And we feel guilt. And all of a sudden we're like, well, why do we feel guilt over the fact that I'm, I'm creating myself? I shouldn't feel guilty. You know, I shouldn't feel bad about the fact that I failed my own standards. But we do. Yeah. And it's and at that point we have to be honest with ourselves and say, okay, something else is going on here. Um, and I think once we begin to be honest with ourselves, and you, you see this really clearly in the parable uh, of the prodigal son, Um, It's not until he looks at his situation, he's like, what am I doing here? I I could go home right now and work as a servant in my father's house and live a better life than this. Yeah. And that's a person that, like, if you think about it, that's what he tried to do is create his own identity. He's like, I reject my family. I reject their way of living. And I'm going to go and create my own lifestyle. And he did. And it made him miserable. Yeah. Even when he lived up to the standards that he had created – um, but he fell short in places. That's when he, it's when he was honest with himself and he said, you know what? This is making me miserable. This is not what I want it to be. And I mean, all you have to do is look around at our culture and realize that a large portion of our culture is miserable. Yeah. And that's not to say that like uh, Christians walk around and it's like a bed of roses and everything's great all the time. And no, we're just realistic about what's going on around us. And we understand based on what we see in scripture, this is what should be happening around us. Um, As far as when sin has its effect, it it leads to death. And so that makes us miserable. But, um, you know, we have a culture that's incredibly free, incredibly wealthy, and yet we're not happy generally speaking. Yeah. And I think that's because we haven't been honest with ourselves. We 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 try to make ourselves the center of the universe and that ultimately has made us unhappy. That's because we were not created to be. Um, yeah. Blaise Pascal, I, I love the illustration. He says that we have this God-sized vacuum in our hearts and we can't fill it with anything besides God. Mm. And it, it, we can try. And the writer of Ecclesiastes tells us to try all these things. He's like, listen, if you want to try, go ahead. Try all those things. Try, you know, try philosophy, try wealth, try success, try relationships, try whatever you want to try. It's not going to make you happy. It's not going to fill that God-sized void in your life. Uh, Only God can do that. Yeah. And you got the example of the the rich young ruler, you know, who comes to Jesus and says, what does it take for me to be saved? And kind of goes through some things and he's like, okay, yeah, I, I can do all that. And then he says, all right. Go sell everything you got, and, you know, and I think that recognizes it's, it's a matter of the heart, you know, mm-hmm. and an issue of, like you said, he was a rich young ruler, you know, he he had you know all these types of things and was kind of the the ruler, you know, of his life and mm-hmm. of those around him and had the opportunity 
you know, and, and at that moment, we, we, like you said, we've got to come to that point of as we can be the creator of our own universe and us dictate what is right for us. But again, as we continue to pour in, it's never going to be enough to fill yeah. that God sized vacuum. Yeah, that's that's great. Mm. Um, kind of circling back a little bit, you know, to the idea of expressing worship. Mm-hmm. Um, what one of the challenges, you know, and I, that you can kind of run into is this idea of kind of just going through the motions of worship. Mm-hmm. You know, whether it be, you know, expressive or the reverent side, kind of like what we talked about earlier in the two sides of that coin. Mm-hmm. Um, or it could be, you know, I just, I'm going to church because I feel like I have to, you know, I feel like that's what I'm supposed to do is yeah. go to church on Sunday and kind of, again, separating that sacred from secular and um, those types of things. You know, wh- wh- what what should someone do if they find themselves in that position where they're just kind of going through the motions? I'm just, the only reason I'm going to church because I feel like this is the one thing I need to do this week, mm-hmm. you know, to kind of check off my list or whatever it may be, right. whatever the reasons are, or this might be better for my kids if I am in church. Yeah. Th- th- those reasons. How, how would someone, you know, or what should someone do if they find themselves in that position? Yeah. I, I would say you're going to do, you need to do two things. And I'm going to put it this way you should continue, but begin. Okay. What I mean by that is you should continue coming. Um, I was tempted to say, well, just stop coming and see how that goes. Um, I think we probably have a group of church attenders that would find out really quickly that they were there for the wrong reasons and um, either would not come back at all uh, and completely move away from the Christian faith or they would come back and, and be renewed. Um, I would I want to encourage you to continue to come for this reason. God can use anything that you put in front of you. So, like, if, if I continually put in front of me someone who's going to faithfully pe- preach the Scriptures or I continually put in front of me somebody who's going to uh, sing songs that glorify God um, or pray um, for me and with me, then I'm going to start to pick up on some of that. Yeah. Uh, eventually, just out of proximity, right? But this is what I would say is if you find yourself in that situation and you're still just kind of going through the motions, I would begin doing something. I would begin asking questions, okay? And so I came up with some questions that I would start to ask myself if I was going through the motions. First of all, why am I here, okay? Um, because it's important that we realize the motivations that we have when we walk into worship. Right? Is it because I'm worried about my kid's spiritual well-being? Well, why would I be worried about my kid's spiritual well-being and not my own? Mm. Um, and then, you know, if if it's because, well, I know I'm supposed to check, I'm supposed to do this. So, well, where in Scripture do we see that we're supposed to do this? And like, what what's around that? Like, if if you point to something like Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, where it says, "Don't neglect the gathering together of of yourselves." There's a whole lot there about like what you should be doing as a part of that. We should encourage one another to good works. We should stir up, you know, our feelings about these things. We should remind each other. So like if I'm here because I'm supposed to be here, but I'm not doing any of that other stuff, then why is that not attached? Um, so why am I here? And I mentioned this in the sermon. What have I done to prepare? Mm. In other words, did I just show up and show up without any preparation, any any anything like that. It'd be like showing up to a baseball game but never having practice. If you show up without preparing for worship, then then basically what you've done is you've shown up to a baseball game without ever practicing with your teammates, never practicing individually to get better. It's going to be a disaster. Um, and the reason that maybe I'm not getting anything out of worship is because I'm not putting anything into it throughout the week. Um, and so I think it's important that, you know, we should ask ourselves the question, we, what have I done to prepare? Have I been in the Word this week? Have I been praying? Have I been uh, worshiping on my own, looking for those experiences or opportunities to worship? Because I want to move away from the, the concept of I need to have worship experience. No, I need to have worship opportunities. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, like, have I been cultivating that stuff in my life? And if I haven't, then why haven't I been doing that? Is it because I'm too busy? Is it because... I'm focused on the wrong things, prioritizing the wrong things, that sort of thing. A third question that I would ask myself, and again, this is another honesty question, is there habitual sin in my life? Yeah. Um, sometimes we go through the motions because we realize that, like, 
I know I'm supposed to be here, but I also really like doing this thing that Scripture tells me is wrong. Um, and so I feel guilt about that, and so I can't open myself up because I'm afraid that God's angry with me or that judgment's coming. Or, yeah. um, And so I think it's important that we ask ourselves the question, is there habitual sin in my life? And the last thing, and this is maybe maybe there was a time in my life where I did experience worship in a real meaningful way, um, and now I'm going through the motions. So my my last question would be, well, what has changed? Yeah. Um, and this is just kind of like looking back over all of those questions. Okay, was there when it, when things were really good and I was really growing in that worship time and I was really I felt like glorifying God through that worship and participating with others. Was that a time when I was really growing in the Word individually um, and that sort of thing? Was that a time where, from a sin perspective, I, I'm not habitually uh, partaking in any particular sin, maybe I, obviously I've, I'm flawed and I've, I fall throughout the week, but I've you know I'm asking for forgiveness. I'm, um, but I'm not habitually taking part in something that I know is wrong. Um, and so I think those are some questions, some baseline questions that I would start to ask myself. So I would continue, but I would begin asking myself these questions and go go wherever the answers are. So like if I find out there is habitual sin in my life that I'm just I'm angry all the time, and I express that anger in inappropriate ways. That's a part of my life where I need to repent and ask for God for forgiveness to, and, and transformation to happen in my life. And I think what you'll see is as that happens, you'll begin to worship will begin to be less of a ritual and more of a uh, positive uh, experience where you participate with other people and you're excited about it. Yeah. So I, I think it's things like that. Yeah, that that's really good. And so so to kind of recap. Because uh, I think those four questions are really good. Um, looking at this idea of you kind of find yourself in a slump or mm-hmm. disengaged from worship, continue but begin asking these questions. You know, why am I here? Mm-hmm. Um, what have I done to prepare? Is there habitual sin? And then what changed in mm-hmm. in my life? You know, where maybe I, I was at I was in a good spot and now I've turned into a mundane. And what, uh, I want to go back to what changed for just a second, because yeah. it may be that you find out that like your schedule in life changed. And I don't mean that like maybe you're still in the word and maybe um, you, you have a good prayer life and that sort of thing, but you have three children that are really young. And so you're really tired on Sunday morning. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's just a <laughs> life situation, a seasonal situation that you find yourself in. And it's not so much a a uh, sinful attitude is it is you just tired. Yeah. You know that that's a part of w- could be the answer to what has changed. Right. And in that situation, maybe you just try to find a way to alter the schedule a little bit to get a little bit more rest before you come on Sunday morning and participate with others. So yeah. I mean that could be another thing that you could add in there. Yeah. Just wanted to yeah. include that. That's good. Um, you know, not all this. You know, the, the sermon and this podcast is really focus on this overflow of gratitude yes. into our practical lives. Um, so I want to kind of circle back around to the, the core basic of someone's hearing all this. Like, yeah, I get it. I recognize the importance of you know gratitude kind of overflowing in my life, but I'm in a place to where I just cannot find something to be grat- uh, grateful for. Yep. You know, and, and you used a great example. You know, like the washing dishes example used in the mm-hmm. sermon. You know, that was a great example of showing a very practical step. Um, but you know, is there any advice or encouragement you would give someone if, if they're trying to they recognize the need for this and want to discover what to be grateful for or discover a reason to show gratitude towards mm-hmm. God where would you tell them a hey, start here yeah um, with any change in life our initial desire is going to make to be make change big mm. um, to, to try to have these huge monumental shifts in our thinking in our behavior those sorts of things those almost always fail, mostly because change really doesn't work that way um, in most cases. In most cases, what you need to do is it, change needs to be incremental. Um, and so the way I would phrase the, the starting of something like this would be to start small and stay small. And what I mean by that is you need to start and focus on small things that you're grateful for. Um, so like if life in general is terrible and you don't want to be gra- grateful for any of it, um, my guess is you can still find something small to focus in on and be grateful for. And it may be as small as I have a toothbrush and toothpaste. I'm glad that I can brush my teeth today and so my teeth don't fall out and I don't have terrible breath and, and you know, those sorts of things. Yeah. 
Um, that may sound so silly, but that is a step toward gratitude. Um, and anytime you can create an incremental habit, a small habit that is repeatable and that is achievable on a regular basis, you're going to be much more likely to be successful. And in the long run, you'll see big changes happen, but those big changes have to be uh, precipitated by small changes, incremental changes uh, in behavior and thinking, that sort of thing. And so that's what I would say is start small, stay small, um, because if you can focus on small things throughout the day, then it's going to make pretty big shifts in your attitude long term. The other thing that I would add is have some sort of trigger. Um, And what I mean by that is I mentioned the idea of a gratitude journal um, I'm not great at journaling, mostly because I have a tendency to lose lose those sorts of things. But like some people are really, really good at it. Um, so a type of trigger would be put put your gratitude journal if you're going to do one in a place that you're going to see it, and that you have to go buy it, you have to pick it up because it's in the way of something else that you have to do every single day. Yeah. So like if you drink coffee every day, put that gratitude journal right next to, by the way, this is true of Bible study and prayer and that sort of thing. Um, put that thing right next to the coffee maker so that you have to look at it. And what you'll say to yourself is, you know what, I need to write something down really quickly. It, it may take five seconds. It may yeah. take two minutes. It may take 20 minutes because you start to write down a bunch of different things. But that trigger is there to remind you, hey, I need to do this. This is an important part of my life. I, I want to make this a habit. I want to make it a discipline. Um, and so, again, I think I think if you if you go with start start small, stay small, and then have some sort of trigger to to help remind you, hey, I need to do this. I think those are two really good small steps that you can take to help start cultivating gratitude in your life daily. Yeah, and I think that's a great example as far as when you start small and you can start showing gratitude in those small things, I think showing gratitude in the big things come is easy, you know, and so mm-hmm. I think it's a great, great, great point. Um, you know, so, so as always, Michael, I appreciate you sitting down and taking time to dig a little deeper in, into your sermon. Uh, those of you who are listening or watching, again, as always, we appreciate it. Uh, we our, our goal here is to just provide you a, an additional resource to kind of take a deeper study in the week. Um, we encourage you to share, uh, like, all those, you know, different ways of, of getting this podcast out into the hands mm-hmm. of people who, who need to hear it. And so if you know someone like that, share it with them and um, discuss it with them. You know, I think yeah. it's a great way to say, hey, listen to this podcast and let's meet together this week for lunch and discuss it together and open God's word together. I think it's a great, you know, way to do that. And um, if, as always, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can uh, contact either one of us or you know, any other staff member for that matter and just, you know, ask questions. And, and always, um, as you read God's word, study it. You know, learn, grow, but don't hesitate to reach out and, and be edified by by others. And um, that's a you know something we, we really encourage everyone to do. And so, um, as always, we we appreciate you listening. Uh, we hope you have a great week, and we'll see you next time.